welcome back to Adaptive Music Adventures. In this series we will be talking about vertical techniques and horizontal techniques and finally my attempt to merge these two into a true hybrid technique. But we'll be focusing the entire series on rendered or recorded music. That means we will not be talking about music data like MIDI and MOD. MIDI files don't contain any actual audio. They're more like score sheets that can be read by a piece of software, like a sequencer. It used to be that sound cards had a synthesizer, and the sequencer would then tell that synthesizer play this note and use this instrument to do it. The problem there was that the instruments on one sound card sounded different from another sound card. So what some games would do is they would include a sound bank, which is a file that actually included instrument sounds, so that it would always sound the same. MIDI is still used in music production today, but now we have sample libraries that not only contain great sounds, but also scripting. Unfortunately, these libraries require a whole lot of processing power, so you couldn't run this directly inside a game. So instead what we do is we record the output of these libraries, so we end up with a file that can be played just like an mp3 file. So whereas general MIDI would sound like this... With a contemporary sample library, it can sound like this. Okay, that was not the best explanation of MIDI, but we're not here to talk about MIDI. So to illustrate what we're not gonna talk about, here's a very famous example. Monkey Island 2. Notice how the music adapts when you move between locations. So whereas Monkey Island 2 used general MIDI, the game No One Lives Forever used a sound bank with custom instruments to achieve pretty much the same effect. So here's something else I will not be talking about, generative music. It's like the composer writes down a few rules and then the engine uses those rules to generate music on the fly. complicated, it's pretty awesome. We're not gonna talk about it. And Rise of the Tomb Raider used it on their percussion, so the rest of the instruments were using conventional adaptive music techniques, but the percussion could actually be generated on the fly by the system. Which is pretty awesome. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about that. One of the first techniques ever used in video games was speeding up the music. Thank you. 
not talking about that. Like we're not gonna talk about techniques where certain elements in a level are synced up to the beat of the music, like they did here and inside. games that are entirely built around that concept. gonna talk about you. Don't get cocky, it's gonna get rocky. We're gonna move down to the next jockey now. Duck! Duck! Jump! Jump! How about sound effects that are always played in the same key as the music? Just a heads up. 
we are also not gonna talk about experimental games like this awesome adventure game where the characters are singing the lines that you have chosen perfectly in sync with the music. Do I know you? You look a little familiar. My name is Prudence Van Damme. You may have heard of me. I am the president and CEO of Phantom Records. You see. Phantom Records, huh? That's, uh, wow. DSP effects are often used in video games when you're dying, or almost dying. But some games, like the Wario games, often use these techniques for some really cool effects. definitely heard this when you went swimming. Or if you have source music, which is music that actually exists in the world of the game. Grim Fandango is actually an interesting example. Listen to how the music gets muffled as Manny moves into the alley. Now back in the days of Grim Fandango, computers were not powerful enough to run DSP effects. So what they did is they recorded two versions of the same music and then they crossfaded between them. So in video games, you have a piece of software, usually called the middleware, that handles the behavior of the music. Middleware is kind of like a DJ on a party, but imagine he's not very good. He relies on whatever requests people are yelling from the dance floor. 
So the middleware doesn't actually understand what's happening in the game, but the game is sending messages to tell it about the current situation. So if people on the dance floor are getting a little excited, the game is gonna tell the middleware, Yo, give us some beats! And the DJ is then going to look in his DJing for Dummies, which is like a rule book written by the composer, to figure out which music to play from his collection and how he's supposed to transition to that music. Like, can he just crossfade or does he have to sync up the beats or can he just switch to the other track? So the game could tell the middleware, Yo, there's, there's 10 people fighting over here. But it could also just send a message, hey, my game state has changed to combat. And then the middleware knows that it should switch to music that reflects that situation. And as soon as the music has changed, you can say that the music state matches the game state. Finally, let's be very clear that all the techniques we'll be talking about can always be combined. So if you're considering putting adaptive music into your game, you do not have to restrict yourself to just one technique. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Next week, I promise it gets a whole lot more interesting when we dive into vertical techniques. I'll see you then.